Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Today was the fourth round of the FIDE Candidates Tournament in Toronto, Canada. So going into this round, Jano Pognacci and Karana were tied for lead with two points out of three games. So let's have a look at what happened in this round. Now, first off, we had the game between Hikaru Nakamura and Pragnananda. Hikaru going into this round had one point. And Pragnananda was on 50% with one and a half. So, you know, an okay start for Pragnananda, but I'm sure that Hikaru was hoping for more. Anyway, let's have a look at what happens in this game. Hikaru opens up with the move 24, and Prag goes for the move 1, e5, sticking to his guns. Knight of 3, knight c6, bishop e5, a6 by Prag, bishop a4. All of this pretty standard. And yesterday, Pragnananda shocked the world of chess with the move f5, the delayed Schleeman Gambit. Now, I'm sure, I was sure he was not going to repeat it. And indeed, in this game, he just sticks to his guns and plays a more standard knight to f6. Now, in round number one, Ferruja here castled with the move castles, but that allows knight takes e4, and this is Pragnanana's main move going into what's called the open Spanish. Now, the only move you have to avoid the open Spanish is the move d3 to protect the spawn over here. All right, so Pragnanana goes bishop to c5. Now, back in the day, moves like d3 would also take your opponent out of book uh, because it becomes less forcing, but these days, pretty much everything is analyzed by all of the top players. So bishop to c5, Play quickly by Pragnananda. We see castles and now the move b5, pushing the bishop away. Bishop to b3 and now pawn to h6, stopping the uh, dark square bishop from ever coming to g5 and also stopping this knight jump. So Karo played a4, putting pressure on the pawn on b5, threatening to take and win a rook in the corner. So Prag just plays the move a rook to b8. We see bishop to e3, offering instead of bishops. And here, you know. Uh, Prag, he can take, he can also just go d6, d6 is also fine, because white can take and double the black pawns, but black should be doing quite fine here, as he has a lot of control in the center. But Prag decides to take, and double the white pawns. Now, the white pawns in the center are actually completely fine, because they control a lot of squares, and they're not weak. The pawns may be doubled, but they're not isolated. So now we see the move d6 by Prag Nanda, pretty standard. He core decides to take, to open up the a file for his rook. All right, so now we see queen e1, trying to bring the queen over to the king side and trying to somehow make use of this half open f file. We see the move castles, and now the move h3 by Prague. We see knight e7, uh, Prague bringing his knight over to the king side, and here knight is c3. Um, okay, so bishop to e6 by Prague offering the trade of bishops, and here Hikaru can take. But Prag just recaptures, and the structure becomes completely symmetrical. So I think Black is doing quite fine here. All right. So hello, hello. How's it going, buddy? Anyway, so here we see the move knight d two, bring the knight over to uh, the the uh, center, so that in case Prag takes, Hikaru can recapture with the knight and keep his pawn structure intact. Of course, he doesn't want to take with the, the pawn. Sorry, I, I got distracted there. Anyway, um, so queen of d7 was played by Prax, so that in case Ikaro takes, he can now also recapture with the queen. And Ikaro goes knight to e2, bringing his knight over to the king's side. All right, so rook to a8 by Prax, trying to uh, contest the only open file on the board. Ikaro takes, black recaptures, and now he takes an eight and goes knight to g3. So... So that is quite active on the g3 square, but it's very difficult to ever do anything. The knight cannot jump to h5, also not to f5. So Prague just plays knight g6. Hikaru goes queen in d1, trying to go knight h5, maybe the trade of the knights. And now we see a rook to a2, hitting the pawn on b2. And Hikaru goes queen b1, hitting the rook away. Prague goes back, queen d1, rook to a2. I think actually Prague might have been a tiny bit better here had he played something like pawn to c5. But perhaps he didn't want to allow knight h5. And also, I mean, he's playing against one of the best players in the field. So it is understandable that he just played rook to a2, queen b1, rook a8, queen d1, and the game ended in a draw. So, I mean, a very, a very fine result for, for Prag. He draws one of the highest seats in the field with black pieces. A slightly disappointing result for Ikaru. I mean, if you want to win the candidates, you do have to win games with white pieces. But, you know, all of these players are super well prepared. So it's very difficult to, to do anything. And uh, yeah, they're going into the rest day, Prague on 50% and Hikaru on what we call minus one, half a point less than 50%. Anyway, let's move on to the next game. The next game was between Nijad Abasov and Ali Reza Perugia. Now, 
going into this game, I was sure that Ferruja would try to take his chances with black. He's playing against the lowest seed in the field. And even though he has the black pieces, he is outrating him by 130 points. So we see Abbasov sticking to his guns with the move 1d4. Knight of 6 by Ferruja and here the move c4. So I was very curious to see how Ferruja would approach this opening. Would he go for someone like the King's Indian? Ferruja plays the move e6. And we saw in round number 1 when Nepo played this against Abbasov. Abbasov played the move knight of c3, inviting the Nims Indian. And Ferruja goes for it. He goes bishop to b4. Following my course, which is, by the way, on sale, everyone. Make sure to check it out. The link is in the description. Or type exclamation courses in the chat. They're the best courses against 1d4. Queen of c2 by Abbasov. A very solid move. Making sure that in case black takes, you can always recapture with the queen. Keeping your pawn structure intact. And also the move queen c2 often facilitates the e2, e4 push. I actually have a lot of move, a lot of games with the queen c2 nims of myself, both from the white side and the black side. And in this game, Ferruja plays the move d6. It's also a move I faced uh, most prominently against Wesley So. And Abbasov, you know, follows my, my game. I played the move e3 against Wesley, castles, and now bishop to d3. So c5 was played. I don't remember exactly. Perhaps in this game I played knight, knight g to e2, which is often a plan. But Abbasov decides to take on c5. And we'll see Ferruja recapturing with the bishop. And now knight to f3. So even though Ferruja tries to imbalance the game, it's honestly very difficult against the very well-prepared opponent, which Abbasov is. I mean, make no mistake about it. He also spent months preparing for this tournament. And yeah, like I said, it's always difficult when you play with black. So d5 was played. Abbas of Castles, and now Ferruja decides to trade on c4. Ferruja, by the way, also still playing quite quickly, so both players might still have been in their preparation. And now we see the move Bishop takes c4 by Nijat. Knight bd7 by Ferruja, played almost instantly, making it very clear that he's still in book. And we see the move b3, after some thought by Abbas. So a very solid move, he wants to feel cat of his bishop. And, you know, the structure is fairly symmetrical, as now both sides have traded off their c and d pawns. There are still a lot of pieces on the board. I mean, all, all minor pieces, the queen and, and the rooks, but because of the nature of the symmetrical nature of the position, it's difficult to see how Ferruja is going to try to imbalance this one. So in this position, he plays the move a6, preparing the b5 push, and Nijot goes bishop to d3, eyeing this pawn on h7, and so that he can meet the move b5 with the move knight to e4, hitting the bishop and the knight on f6. Now, the idea is that black cannot take as you take with the bishop, hitting the rook, and you win the pawn on h7. And today, Chess.com was very generous with handing out brilliant moves. In this position, Ferruja played Bishop b7, which is a good move, but brilliant. I personally find it a bit generous. Well, at first glance, it might seem like Black is hanging the bishop. But the idea is that in case white takes, you recapture. And if you take the knight, then Black goes queen takes d3, as this bishop is hanging as well. And Black is doing perfectly fine. So Nijat found a brilliant bishop takes b5 again. I think a little generous. I mean, he, he just has a mind that, hey, in case you take the, the, the bishop, you might as well, you know, get a pawn for it before you take the knight. And now Ferruja finds the brilliant knight takes b3. Again, I mean, okay, he's, he's saying like, okay, if I lose my knight, I might as well just get a pawn for it. No, I personally don't really find it brilliant. But anyway, queen takes b3, pawn takes b5. And here, you know, the structure is fairly symmetrical. You cannot take the pawn on b5 as that runs into bishop a6, hitting the queen, and you win the rook for the bishop on f1, and black's winning. So Abbasov goes rook to d1, hitting the queen on d8. Now queen c7 by Ferruja, a nice move. Because with this move, he's actually eyeing the king on g1. If you don't pay attention here, play a slow move like a3. Black all of a sudden goes knight g4, threatening to take here and here. And there's not much you can do about it. Black's just absolutely crushing. To illustrate, let's say you go h3. Black takes here. If you take the knight, you lose the rook, and you're lost. And if you take the bishop, well, that's even worse, because then there's check and a mate. All right, which is why Abbasov goes bishop to b2. Now, knight g4 can always be met either with a rook to c1 or queen c3, forcing the queen trade as you try and check mid on g7 yourself. So queen c5 was played by Ali Reza, trying to activate his queen along the fifth uh, rank. We see a trade. Rook a c1, queen f5. Again, the position is fairly symmetrical. Both sides only have one minor piece left. Ferruja does have these double pawns, but it's completely fine. And in some cases, it can work to his advantage if he goes king h8 or rook g8 to put pressure on his pawn on g2. 
Um, so knee jot goes knight e4, hitting the queen on f5. Queen g5, threatening a checkmate. And so he wants to provoke this move g3, as that will create a lot of light squared weaknesses around the white king. So Basov goes knight to c6, blocking the diagonal. Rook a6 by Ferruja, hitting the knight. The knight absolutely cannot move. And now Abbasov finds the only move to stay in the game, which is the move h4, hitting the queen. Now the queen, it's not that easy to stay on the g-file. First of all, I mean, if, if you go here, this runs into a deadly fork, and you lose your queen. But also, if you go to g7 to i this pawn over here, white can take, the knight's protected, and white's just up a pawn. So Ferruja takes the pawn. Now Abbasov can take over here, as now this is no longer protected. And here Ferruja finds the brilliant rook takes a2. I mean, what is brilliant about this? Like, anyone can see that in case you take the bishop, you take a mate, but... And Chesikov was super generous today. G3 was played, blocking off the diagonal. Ferruja took Abbasov recaptures. And so here we get this position in which black is up a pawn. Black's got four pawns against three moves from white. But these pawns over here are doubled, so it's super difficult to really try to convert this into a full point. So Queen H5 was played by Ferruja. King e g2, trying to bring his rook into the game with rook h1. Rook b8 was played, trying to activate the other rook, but Abbasov played very solid defense here. Queen f3, offering the trade of queens. Ferruja decided to keep the queens on. Now, if Ferruja is able to go rook b8 here and force Abbasov to go passive, then there might be some chance with two pairs of rooks on the board. But Abbasov goes rook a1, getting a pair of rooks off the board. And so it's very difficult for Ferruja to do anything. So we see take, take. See king g7. Rook a4, good move. Threatening rook g4, which would actually win the game. As then the, the queen is lost. So rook b5 was played to be able to meet this with this. All right, so rook f4, h5, e4, rook to g5. You know, for, this might objectively be a draw, but Ferruja definitely is still trying here. So we see king h3. We see e5. I mean, all of it, again, perhaps is just a draw, but I feel like e5... Forces the issue a little bit uh, quickly. So e5 was played. Rook f5, we see a trade. And Abbasov took with the queen. He evaluated that, hey, in case black takes, he's actually completely fine here. As he's going to go king h4, and his pawn will actually end up um, being lost. Like, let's say you go uh, king h6, king h4, e4. White can go g4, and after takes, takes. White can pick up this pawn over here, and it's just a very easy draw. All right. So, king h6 was played by uh, Ferruja, and now Basso finds the only move, queen to f3. You have to hold on to this pawn over here, as Ferruja was trying to take and go king to g5. Alright, so queen f3, queen g5. I mean, Ferruja here is trying, but he's up a pawn, but with the, with the double pawns, it's super difficult to do anything. He goes f5, but now the problem is that your king gets a little bit exposed. And in queen and games, that means that the opponent is going to get a lot of checks. So, he's trying, trying to push forward, but Abbasov playing good defense here very difficult for white to, for sorry for black to do anything he gives some checks some more checks and yeah i mean you have this past h bomb but it's almost impossible to do anything with it so yeah abasov played a very nice defensive effort here um and eventually this game ends in a draw so yeah another very solid result for abasov he's playing good chess in this event and he is once again showing to the players in the, in the candidates, hey, if you want to beat me, especially with black, you're going to have to take risks. He's playing rock solid chess, and I think it's the right strategy. He's trying to provoke them, trying to take crazy risks against him, and then he will take his chance. So I, I think he's, uh, he's maximizing his chances, which is you know a very impressive effort as he's by far the underdog in the field. All right, let's have a look at the next game. The next game was played between Fabiano Caruana and Gu Cash. So Fabiano had the white pieces. He opens up with e4. We see 5 by black, knight of 3, knight c6, and bishop to c4. So the Italian game. The other main move is, of course, the move bishop to b5, the ruler pass. So Gu Cash just copies bishop to c5, castles, knight of 6. All of this is pretty standard d3, d6. And in the Italian, there are many different plans. Like, you can play this very aggressively with a quick c3 and d4. But you can also play this very slowly, the Joko Piano, which means like the slow game, I think. Slow game, slow Italian, I think. I think slow game. With the move c3 and d3. So castles, knight of 6, d3, d6, c3, a6. We see Fabiano going a4, gaining a little bit of space on the queen side. Gukash drops his bishop back to a7. 
H3 cancels Knight BD2. And in this position, there are just so many plans, it's almost difficult to name all of them. For example, you can go Knight E7 to G6, you can go Bishop E6, offering your trade of bishops. In the case why it takes you accept these double pawns. You can also go for the plan that Gukesh went for with Rook E8 and then Bishop E6. So that in case white takes, you can now recapture with the Rook and keep your pawn structure intact. All right, so Rook to E1, oh, sorry, Queen C2, Rook E8, and now Rook E1 by Fabiano, H6 by Gukesh. And now Fabiano went for a very typical plan, Knight F1, with the idea to go Knight to G3, or sometimes Bishop E3, and then bring the Knight into the middle. All right. All right, so I'm being told that Gyoko Piano actually means a quiet game. Yeah, no, that's what I was trying to say. But right, so Knight G3 was played by Fabiano, a pretty typical maneuver in the Italian or sometimes in the Rulo Pass. We see Pawn to B5, Knight of 5 by Fabiano, because this Knight in the 5 is pretty annoying. It's not easy to get rid of it at all. You cannot go G6. It's going to hang this pawn over here. And so Gukash just takes and now plays Knight E7, trying to trade off the Knight on F5. With move 97, he is hanging this pawn though, but it's a bit of a sacrifice. Perhaps what Fabiano should have done is keep the knight on the 5 with the move knight h4. His black takes, you get another knight on the 5. And I like white's chances here. One nice idea here, for example, is to go for a quick c4 and then rook a3, rook g3, and then all of a sudden go and attack for the black king. So let's say bishop b6, c4, let's say take, rook a3, and this can all of a sudden get very dangerous. But instead, he takes a pawn. But I feel like this lets Gukash off the hook a little bit. It makes his moves a lot easier. Takes an f5, wide recaptures. And now again, you're down a pawn, but it's a double pawn. This bishop is active, the rook is active. The white's slightly underdeveloped. So Gukash goes pawn to c5, trying to open up the position so his active piece will count for more. We see Fabiano going bishop to f4, and now he takes on a4. So Fabiano goes knight to c6, hitting the queen and the bishop. We see queen e7, we see a trade. Takes the bishop, and now a very nice move, pawn takes b4. If you take on a7 with the queen right away, white's got bishop b3, pinning the pawn over here. And if you pick up this pawn and this pawn, white's all of a sudden doing very well on the queen side. All right, so we see pawn takes b4, white recaptures, and now another excellent move by Gukesh, queen to d4. This is not a double attack, this is a triple attack, hitting this, this, and this. And perhaps this might be a move that Fabiano has missed. Perhaps he might have, you know, counted on the move queen takes a7. You know, here white takes, is doing pretty well. This pawn is weak. White's up a pawn. And this looks like a tough defense for Gukesh. But queen e4, fantastic move. Again, hitting almost every single piece on the board. And so Fabiano goes queen to c1. He doesn't want to give up the bishop, as he would rather give up the knight, which is kind of misplaced over here anyway. So now Gukesh takes, and the difference is that now the queen on c1 is a little bit more passive than... It would have been on c2, as then I can take here, and the pawn on a6 becomes very weak. So Fabiano takes a pawn, now queen b7 by Gukesh. Again, he's down a pawn, but the pawn on f5 is a little bit weak, and again, it's a double pawn. So very difficult for Fabiano to create ri winning chances here. Because queen e2, knight e5, hitting the bishop, bishop to g3, and now pawn to f6. Stopping white from ever playing f5, f6 himself to try to open up the black king. All right, so we see bishop to z6, queen c6, good move, hitting the rook. And the bishop, so rook a5, black takes, and Fabiano takes on d5 with the rook. But now we see rook to e1. This would have been checkmate if not for the queen here. Black gives up the rook, but the idea is that black will get the rook on d5 himself. So after takes, takes. Now here what white can do, white can actually go into a pawning game with the move queen e6. And often, you know, if you go into a pawning game up a pawn, you're usually winning. But Gukesh... Had all of this calculated, he saw that, hey, if white does that, I'm going to take. Go king of 8, king e7 on the next move and pick this up. And in case white goes f4 to go f5, black goes f5 himself to stop it. And g4 can be met with g6. And again, after takes, takes, black's going to pick up the pawn. And it should just be a draw. All right, so g4 was played by Fabiano defending the pawn. But here, once again, we have a queen in game. White does have an extra pawn, but the extra pawn is double. So super difficult to convert. King h7 by Gukesh, queen c3, queen e4, and the players were just shuffling back and forth. Fabiano, I mean, he was definitely trying, but again, with the double pawn, I think it's just so difficult to ever make any progress. I mean, we saw a pawn trade on g4, now a check, he picks up this pawn, and now especially since all of the pawns are on one flank, I think it's pretty much impossible to win. Gukesh gives a check, keeps checking, check, check, 
check the screen here check and eventually after some checks check check i mean again this this part of the game is not the most exciting so i'm just fasting forward um it ends in a draw so not the most exciting game eventually ends in a draw okay results for both players fabiano is still tied for the is still you know in the top half with two and a half out of four good cash as well he's also on two and a half out of four and again he's had a great start he's in the top half as the junior player in the field which is absolutely amazing to see now let's go to the game of the round the game of the round was definitely the game between Jan Pomniacci and Vidit Gucciarati. Going into this round, Nepo was one of the leaders with two points out of three games. And Vidit was on 50%. He won a fantastic game with the black pieces against Hikaru in round number two. But unfortunately for him, yesterday he lost with the white pieces against Pragnananda. So let's have a look. Nepo opens up with his bread and butter to move E2, E4. And E5 by Vidit, sticking to his guns. Knight of three, knight C6, bishop E5, Nepo going for the Rulo pass. And what is the most solid defense against the Rulo Pass? The move Knight of Six, the Berlin. Now, this is also what Vidit played against Hikaru in round number two, where he won in crushing uh, style. In that game, Hikaru played the move D3. But in this game, Nepo goes for the critical test of the Berlin, the Berlin endgame, which arises after castles, Knight C4, and now pawn to D4. White sacrifices a pawn in the middle, so he wants to open up the center as quickly as possible. And you cannot take this pawn. It's now why we'll go rook to e1, take advantage of the of the open e file, and d5 can be met with knight takes here, hitting the knight. f3 is also a threat. So this is why black should not take. Instead, the move is knight d6, hitting the bishop on b5. Now here, a lot of exciting games have contained with pawn takes e5, knight takes b5, a4, trapping the knight. But black goes here, then uh, takes... And then d5. After takes, takes, queen takes, then queen e4 check, queen e6, and often these games have ended in draws. All right. Um, um, all right. So let's uh, let's have a look. Instead, the main line is to give up the bishop for the knight first. Black recaptures and then take here, hitting the knight. Knight f5, and white takes and goes into this endgame. Now, at first glance. This might look great for white. You're like, what is black doing? White's got a four versus three majority on the king side. Black's king is in the middle. And black's got this three and a half versus um, three majority on the queen side. So you could argue that white is up half a pawn. But the thing is, what does black have? Black has the bishop pair. That's his big trump. The bishop's on c8 and e8 because the bishop. The position is fairly open, so that is really what Black is banking on in this endgame. Anyway, here Jan continues with the move in Knight of C3, the standard move. And here there's many ways for Black to play this position. For example, one plan is to go Bishop E7, followed by Knight H4, training up the Knights quickly. Another plan is to go King E8, combined with H5, trying to clamp down on the G4 push. Vidit goes for another plan. He goes for the move Bishop to D7. This is also completely fine with the idea to go b6, king c8, and king b7, and try to connect the rooks that way, because that, to be fair, is a problem for black. Black cannot easily connect the rooks, but if you can get the king here, black's doing pretty well. Nepo plays pawn to h3, trying to gain some space on the king side, and Vidit goes pawn to h6 to take out this annoying knight g5 jump. And here, the move Nepo played is not a novelty, but it's a move that has not been played a whole lot. Most games here have contained with moves like b3, followed by bishop b2, rook 81. For example, let's say black goes here, bishop b2, king c8, rook 81, and you know, so forth. Rook d2, rook d1 is an idea, or rook here. I'm sure Vidit was ready for this, but Jan came up with the move g4. Again, this is not a novelty. He's attacking the knight, so black only has one move, which is knight e7. But the move here is, the move he goes for is the move knight to h2. Now you might be wondering, wait, why does he move his knight, which was developed, closer to the center? Why does he move it backwards, right? I mean, we're, we're supposed to, you know, put, move our pieces up. Well, the idea is that he wants to go f2, f4 and gain a lot of space on the queen, king side. Again, that's where he has a space advantage. He wants to go f2, f4, maybe f5, bring out the bishop, 
And then all of a sudden, this four versus three majority is really felt. Which is why Vita played the move g5. He's allowing f4, but now he can take. So Nepo recaptured. Nepo, by the way, is still playing super quickly, making it clear that he's still in his preparation. And so Vidit here must have been feeling the heat. He's down 40 minutes on the clock. He's in his opponent's preparation. And it feels like White already has a pretty pleasant position. His pawn on h6 is a little bit weak. The pawn on f7 is a little bit weak. And now he goes bishop d6. And furthermore, this f6 square is also a little bit weak. White can potentially put a knight there. So Nepo goes knight e4 again, still playing quickly. I think it was still in book. And here Vidit goes b6, stopping the move knight to c5. So a lot of talk has been, uh, there's been a lot of talk. Like what do these players have their seconds for? What are these training camps about? Well, these training camps are to uh, try to find new ideas in the opening. And that's what Nepo found here. You know, if you find a new idea, you catch your opponent off guard, that can give you really good chances to win the game. And that's why, again, they spent months and months on preparation. So here, Knight of Three was played by uh, Jan, bringing his Knight in, back into the game. He played this fairly quickly after like a five or six minute thing. So... I don't know if he was in his preparation or not at all. Anyway, only Jan knows. Vidit played the move c5, very natural. Now his knight can move here. And Jan goes king of two. Oh no, wait, sorry. He parks a knight on f6, king c8, and now he goes king of g2. Slowly but surely improving his position because it's very difficult for black to do anything. King b7, king of g3. And again, these pawns are a little bit weak. White's got, White's got easy play here. Tough position for Vidit, especially considering the time situation. Just pawn a5 to gain some space on the, the king side. And perhaps here Jan made a bit of a mistake. With the move a5, what Vidit wants to do is go a4 and then maybe rook a5, rook b5, create some counterplay over here. Perhaps Jan should have just stopped it altogether with the move a4, making sure that this rook stays locked in a little bit. Uh, thanks, Chess24D, for the raid. Appreciate it. So a3 was played. Now Vidit goes a4. We see rook 81, and now knight to c6 to bring this knight back into the game. But again, look at the clock. Vid it down 15 minutes on the clock. And keep in mind that there is no increment. So if you have no time, you're in serious time pressure. There's not, there's not a 30 second uh, bonus after every move you make. Nepo goes c3, and now we see bishop b7 by Vid it. Nepo goes knight h4 with the idea to go knight here. Now, I think Nepo might not have played this you know, completely precise, but he always kept pressure. He kept playing quickly, kept putting pressure on Vidit. And I think eventually, you know, that that uh, it's it's not easy to deal with. Vidit finds a good move though, with pawn to h5. Now, the thing is, you cannot take this pawn, as black will sack the rook, and in case you take, go rook g8 check. The king has to move, and now you take the knight, and black's completely winning here, as these bishops are just absolutely crushing. Generally, generally as a rule thump, Two minor pieces are usually better than a rook, and we see that right here. All right, so Nepo goes g5, trying to keep uh, you know his king sheltered. We see rook a5 by Vidit, a very natural move to go here to hit this pawn. But now Nepo goes rook d1, rook b5, and rook. Oh, sorry, goes bishop to c1, protecting this pawn over here. Now here, Vidit makes a serious mistake. What he should have done here is the move c4 to take this pawn over here, and I'm not 100% sure how Jan would have protected here right but in the game Vita goes rook to b3 and the rook over here ends up being a little bit stuck right i mean if you can get maybe knight here and here you're putting a lot of pressure but if not then the rook can easily be offside from all of the action that's happening on the king side and that's when that's why nepo took his chance here to try to break through he went pawn to g6 b g7 is a big threat hitting the rook threatening the queen so Vidit had to take, recaptures, and now rook to d8. All right, now we see knight takes e7, takes, and Nepo picks up the pawn on h5. So he now has a passed e pawn, and a passed h pawn. All right, we see check on d3. Nepo blocks, takes, takes, and now Vidit can take a, pick up the pawn on h3. But the moment you pick up this pawn, Nepo can now play the move e6. And this pawn is getting closer and closer to promotion. Vidit here finds the only move, he goes pawn to b5, excellent move, trying to go b4, to try to get this rook back to life again. And, but, you know, besides being under pressure on the, on the board, also again, look at the clock. The pawn machine she has got 54 minutes, Vidit's got 8, and Vidit needs to make another 7 moves to reach the time control. So we see bishop to g5, good move, hitting the knight, 
the knight went to d5, e7, the pawn is one square away from promotion, and so if he had played bishop to d7. If you give up the knight for the pawn, you really do not have enough compensation. That's why it's going to take here and here, and the extra knight here should decide in the endgame. So bishop to d7, only move. You see rook to d1, hitting the knight. And here, king c6. Perhaps already a serious mistake by Vidit. Seems like instead he should have played the move bishop to c6, defending the knight that way, because in case you take, you take with check. But again, super difficult to figure out what's going on, especially when you're getting low on time. So here, you know, there are moves like king g3, stepping out of this x-ray, so that in case black takes, you can take. This is no longer a check, so white will promote. And, you know, maybe black can sack the knight here, but again, super difficult to figure out what exactly is going on. And difficult to go for this when your clock is ticking. So if it goes king to c6, defending the knight. And now, again, if he's able to take here and bring his rook back into the game, he's doing quite fine. But Nepo finds a nice move, king to e4, hitting the knight. Which, you know, is in a bit of trouble. If you go knight b6, for example, there's knight. Um, well, you can also take here, and in case black takes, the knight g7, followed by e8. It's just completely over. White gets a queen, and black gets absolutely nothing. But the move Vidit had to go for here is to sack the knight. Knight takes c7, and in case white takes, goes rook takes b2. White is probably winning here with the extra piece in the endgame, but, you know, black's got two pawns. Black's got four pawns on the queen side, white's got two pawns, so definitely still chances here for a draw. But the move Vidit played here is losing. He played the move bishop to e8, creating a counter threat on the knight. But now Nepo just took the knight, Vidit took the knight on h5, and Nepo goes bishop to c1. Not only defending this pawn over here and making sure the rook is trapped, but also hitting this bishop over here, which is running out of moves. This, diag this diagonal is actually pretty pretty short. Vidit gave a check, king up, and now he goes pawn to b4 to try to free up his rook and get it back into the game. But Nepo goes king f6, hitting the bishop. He's sacrificing his own rook, but in case you take, white takes here. He's going to get a new queen. So Vidit played bishop to e8. And now rook d8. And again, the bishop is simply trapped. White's going to take, move the rook out of the way, <coughs> get a queen, and that's all. That's really all there's to it. Vida took the pawn on a3. And the idea is that in case you go, let's say bishop here, white goes rook here. And again, the king is taking away the g6 square and the f7 square, and the rook is taking away the e8 square and the h5 square. So Vida took an a3. Now Nepo takes. He just recaptures. Bishop d7. And now king f7. Threatening takes, e8, queen, and it's just completely over. So, very nice win here for Jan. He takes the lead in the candidate storm. He storms away with three points out of four games. And keep in mind, everyone, Jan Pomniac, he also won the candidates in 2021 slash 20. No, wait, sorry, 2020 slash 2021. He completely dominated the field in 2022. Can he do it again? Can he go on a three-peat? Can he win the candidates once again in 2024? He's showing that in the candidates, he always brings his A-game. He's super well-prepared. There's nice ideas with white, also nice ideas with black. So it's very early still in the tournament. Fabiano and Gukesh are on his heels. But, you know, at this point, he, someone like Hikaru needs to start winning sooner rather than later, you know? Because you don't want to be in the bottom half for too long. Anyway, I hope all of you guys enjoyed the recap. Tomorrow is a well-deserved rest day for the tournament. And I look forward to seeing all of you guys in the next video.